thanks everyone for coming. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, my dissertation work focusing on the genetics of adaptation in island populations of rattlesnakes. So I'm largely interested in adaptation. Pretty much everyone in Darren's lab is interested in adaptation. So adaptations are characteristics of an individual that increase their ability to survive and reproduce relative to another individual that doesn't possess that particular characteristic or trait. And adaptations are the products of natural selection. So natural selection requires heritable phenotypic variation, like the variation in beak morphology seen here. This variation must result in differential fitness that enables the sorting of phenotypes in the next generation. Although selection acts on the phenotype, it's actually the genotype that is passed from one generation to the next. So if we want to understand the process of adaptation, we need to understand the genetic basis of the trait that we're interested in. Unfortunately, connecting genotype and phenotype and fitness-related traits is often very difficult. Typically, identifying ecologically important traits is fairly straightforward. We can all see the camouflage of these leaf-tailed geckos that are sitting here and understand how that's important to the ecology of the animal. But discerning exactly how that trait's trait affects fitness, and the genetic basis of that trait is often much more difficult, um, the latter mainly because a lot of ecologically critical traits are quantitative and therefore unlikely to have a simple genetic basis. Because of this, the genetics of adaptation has mainly been described in natural populations for traits with relatively simple genetic bases. And what I mean by that is they are controlled by one to maybe several loci. And we have great examples of these in natural populations such as pigmentation variation due to specific mutations in MC1R, in mice and lizards, uh, regulatory variation in calmodium and other loci that leads to variation in beak morphology, as well as regulatory variation in the notch distalis pathway that leads to eye spot variation in butterfly wings. But again, these are all controlled by one, maybe two or three different loci. What about complex traits? Well, understanding the genetic basis of complex traits is very difficult because they are complex or polygenic, meaning they are essentially the result of many loci, and discerning the relative contributions of an individual locus for a complex trait is often very difficult. But despite this shortcoming, many important traits, some people would even argue the majority of ecologically important traits, are actually complex. But our knowledge on adaptive rates, mechanisms underlying adaptation, constraints on adaptive evolution, our knowledge on these factors is based on traits with relatively simple genetic bases. And these factors may be very different in complex traits. So what we need is we need a genetically tractable complex trait to understand the genetic basis of adaptation more completely. Fortunately for me is that snake venom is such a trait. So snake venoms have sort of emerged as a great system for understanding the genetics of adaptation because they're ecologically important due to their roles in feeding and defense. They've been shown to evolve at unusually high evolutionary rates, very large DNDS ratios, indicating their importance to fitness. And again, despite being quantitative, despite being complex, they are in fact genetically tractable. So what are venoms? Um, so venoms are these complex cocktails of about 40 to 100 proteinaceous toxins, and they are produced in the venom gland seen here. And because of, the, because of the specialization of this land towards toxin production, we can actually use some fairly straightforward OMIC approaches to identify the genetic basis of that trait. The first OMIC approach is transcriptomics. So transcriptomics, or RNA-seq, it essentially allows us to identify the genes that are producing our venom. Uh, so what we do is we remove the venom glands from a single individual. We isolate and sequence the messenger RNA on an alumina platform. And that allows us to identify all the genes that are being actively expressed in that gland. We then de novo assemble the transcriptome. We identify the venom genes uh, based on homology to other proteins that we can characterize in other species. And we identify typically, again, between 40 and 100 genes that are actively expressed in the venom gland. And that's what we see here. So uh, the transcripts over here are color-coded by gene family. We have expression increasing on the y-axis. We can see that the most highly expressed transcript it, uh, causes spastic paralysis in the highlands of prey. These green bars here are C-type lectins. They essentially prevent your blood from coagulating. But again, these identifications, they're based on homology to proteins that have been characterized and sometimes somewhat distantly related species. We want to be sure that the genes that we're identifying that are expressed in our transcriptome actually produce the venom that, and the phenotype that we're interested in. So essentially what we need to do is verify the secretion of these transfer products into the venom itself. And for this, we use a proteomic approach. So we use reverse phase high performance liquid chromatography. 
or our pH PLC, to separate the venom into its constituent components, which are the individual peaks that you see here. So each one of these peaks contains one to several toxins. We collect each peak, and then we perform mass spectrometry to identify the particular protein or amino acid sequences present in that peak. And then we then map these sequences back to the sequences we identified in the transcriptome to verify that this particular transcript is in fact the venom gene. It's secreted into the venom, so the protein that causes spastic paralysis is present in peak 2, so we know that that locus actually produces the phenotype that we're interested in. And we do this for all peaks, and essentially correlate our transcriptomic data with our proteomic data, and we now have identified the genetic basis of this complex trait. So what types of questions can we now begin to answer that we understand the genetic basis of this trait? Well, sort of the crux of my dissertation, I was interested in which is the predominant mechanism underlying adaptive evolution. And over the past couple of decades, there has been a fairly contentious debate um, arguing whether regulatory variants or structural variants are the predominant mechanism underlying adaptive evolution. So evolutionary developmental biology, or EVO-DEVO, this argued that cis-regulatory variants were the predominant mechanism because the modularity of these elements frees them from deleterious pleiotropic effects that are common to mutations in protein coding regions. Um, so essentially what all of that means is that proteins often participate in multiple processes and they often perform very different functions in each process. Therefore we can imagine that a mutation within the coding region that changes the amino acid sequence, while it may be beneficial for one function, it's unlikely to be beneficial for all functions. And that sort of constra constrains sequence evolution of proteins. Whereas this regulatory variants, they simply change the timing, location, or amount of a particular protein produced, and they can actually be process specific. But as pointed out by Hopi Hoekstra and Jerry Coyne in their 2007 Locus of Evolution paper, is that mutations within pleiotropic genes may not necessarily exhibit antagonistic pleiotropic effects, <coughs> because proteins themselves can actually be modular through functional domains or things such as alternative splicing. And they argue that structural variation is at least equally as important to the adaptive process as regulatory variants. Now again, this debate got very contentious. Um, people argued back and forth, said terrible things about each other. But if we go to the literature, we actually see evidence for both mechanisms. So we have great examples of adaptive structural variants, such as specific substitutions in MC1R and Agouti that lead to coat color variation in mice. We also see specific mutations that change oxygen binding efficiency in high altitude populations in hemoglobin across a number of taxa. Well, again, we also see regulatory variation. I've already touched on these. So we see uh, differences in the expression of Calmodium in uh, Darwin's finches that leads to beak morphology evolution and the Notch distillus pathway that changes uh, wing spots in butterflies. So which is the predominant mechanism? Well, again, we have examples of both, but again, these are in traits with simple genetic bases. And what we find if we dig into the literature is that specific traits may be biased towards particular mutational pathways, such as regulatory variation being favored for morphological traits, or structural variation being favored for pigmentation variation, or detrototoxin resistance. And we see these biases hold out across a number of animal taxa. But again, what about complex traits? What's the predominant mechanism in a complex trait? Well, to answer this, we don't necessarily want a trait that's inherently biased towards a particular mutational pathway, like these here, because that's obviously going to bias our results. So we need a uh, complex trait that isn't biased towards either regulatory variation or structural variation. And as you guys may have guessed, venom again provides us with such a trait. So because venom genes are only expressed in the venom gland, the modularity of the venom gland sort of precludes deleterious pleiotropic effects from favoring regulatory variation. So venom genes are only expressed here, they have one function, one job, so their sequence evolution is not constrained like other proteins that participate in multiple processes and perform multiple functions. So that brings me to sort of the main question of my dissertation work. I want to know what is the genetic basis of adaptation for a complex trait that is not inherently biased towards a particular mutational pathway. And despite everything that I just told you about how it's unbiased, I predicted that it would predominantly be expression variation. So why would I predict that expression variation would be the predominant mechanism when I tell you that this trait isn't inherently biased towards either mutational class? The reason is there's just more mutational mechanisms for changing the amount of a protein produced than there are for altering their functions through their primary sequence. So structural variation can only essentially occur through one way. It has to be a non-synonymous point mutation 
within the coding region of a protein, often within a very specific region of the coding region for that protein. Whereas regulatory variation can occur through cis regulatory variation, copy number variation, post transcriptional regulation through small RNAs, translational efficiency. So we can imagine that if there is no innate trait based bias, that complex traits should preferentially evolve through regulatory variation. And throughout the rest of my talk, I'm going to be referring to expression variation. And unlike Evo Devo, where it just corresponds to cis regulatory variation, Expression variation in my study could correspond to any number of these mechanisms. So my dissertation work focused on the eastern diamondback rattlesnake. So it's the largest species of rattlesnake. It's native to seven states in the southeastern U.S. It's recently become a conservation concern. Uh, it's listed as endangered in North Carolina, and it's extirpated from Louisiana. It's actually up for listing um, as uh, threatened under the Endangered Species Act. Um, so its diet is exclusively consumes endotherms with rats, squirrels, and rabbits, comprising the majority of the diet. And it's actually a very good swimmer. Um, it frequently inhabits barrier islands in the southeast. And there's actually even a museum specimen from Dry Tortugas National Park. So why am I talking about islands? Well, a lot of my dissertation work actually focus on island populations of rattlesnakes. So why do we study islands? Well, islands provide these discrete, isolated systems that essentially provide us with natural experiments that have been set up and run for thousands or sometimes even millions of years. And specific attributes of islands, such as changes in abiotic conditions or changes in species assemblages, that often lead to these altered interactions that enable us to study, that enable us to study contemporary adaptive evolution. So most of my work focused on seven different populations. So I collected off of venom and blood samples from 123 individuals across seven different populations. These populations were defined sort of a priori based on putative biogeographic barriers. Um, so for example, the Apalachicola River separates populations one and two. The Sewanee River separates populations two and three. Geographic distance separates populations three and four. And then populations five, six, and seven, these are all island populations. We have Little St. George Island here, Caledese Island near Clearwater, Florida here, and Sapelo Island up in Georgia. So this is sort of an outline for my talk, an outline for my dissertation work. I'm um, going to spend more time on certain sections than others. But the first step was sort of identifying the genetic basis of the trait using that transcriptome proteome mapping approach that I described earlier. Can then use this map to identify expression variation. Um, can then use in vitro assays to test whether that expression variation actually affects the phenotype. Does it alter venom function? Identify sequence variation and then directly compare the two to answer my main questions. And where I attempt to connect genotype, phenotype, and fitness. But first, we need to identify the genetic basis of the trait. So we sequenced the venom gland transcriptome of a single individual from North Florida. We did our de novo assembly, and we identified 76 unique toxin transcripts, again seen here. We then grouped these transcripts into what we called clusters. So we identified 44 clusters, and essentially anything less than 1% divergent at the nucleotide level we lumped into a single cluster. So this helps account for alleles and sequencing errors. It was also necessary for accurate abundance estimation. So what you're seeing here in the plot, again, we have expression in terms of number of reads in the transcriptome increasing on the y-axis. And again, each individual transcript is color-coded by gene family. So then we used our proteomic approach, and we detected evidence for 21 of the 44 clusters that we identified in the transcriptome. So an asterisk above that individual bar indicates that we identified that particular transcript in the venom itself. And we can see there's an obvious detection threshold at our proteomic <coughs> approach. So we identify the majority of highly expressed proteins, uh, highly expressed transcripts. We can see that we failed to identify the transcript products of a lot of the low expression uh, toxins. This is just it's a limitation inherent in our approach. Um, but we did identify 15 of the 20 most highly expressed transcripts, the majority of the most abundant proteins that comprise the genetic basis of this trait. Okay, so I won't bore you guys anymore with transcriptomics. We've identified the genetic basis of this trait. So now we can use this map to begin to look at expression differentiation. So expression variation is typically measured at the messenger RNA level. Uh, the proteome, however, is actually closer to the phenotype, particularly for venoms, because different amounts of different proteins have been shown to directly affect venom function or venom phenotype. And because venom is a secretion, we can directly measure protein expression using that liquid chromatography approach I touched on earlier. So what you're seeing here, these are individual chromatograms for different venom samples. 
So we would run the chromatography on each venom. We'd identify 25 different peaks, which are labeled here. Because of our transcriptome protein map, we know what protein or proteins are present in each one of these peaks. And the area underneath each peak corresponds to the abundance or the expression level of that toxin or set of toxins. And we can then use this information to look at population-wide patterns of expression differentiation. So again, we looked at 123 samples across these same seven populations, but we also looked at expression differentiation across age classes. Uh, so some rattlesnakes are uh, known to go, um, undergo an ontogenetic shift in venom expression, so juveniles have a very different venom phenotype than adults. Um, previous work uh, from people at Marshall in South Carolina shows that adamantius reaches sexual maturity at about 102 centimeters south vent length. So we use this as a sort of an a priori threshold to separate our samples into age classes. So we performed a non-parametric MANOVA, and what we found is we found significant geographic variation, significant ontogenetic variation, and our interaction term is also significant, indicating that uh, population uh, differentiation may be different across age classes. Um, so for the rest of this talk, I'm actually just going to be focusing on geographic variation. I'm more interested in inter population variation than intra-individual variation. Um, I just wanted to point this out. This is why a lot of these results I'm going to be talking about here for expression we limit to adults to avoid the confounding effects of ontogeny. So the next thing I did was some randomization tests to determine which populations were different. So this result here tells us there is significant differentiation in expression, but does not tell us which populations were actually different. So I performed randomization tests, and what I identified is five distinct adult expression profiles or phenotypes across these seven populations. So essentially everything north of the Suwannee River, seen here in red, possessed the same venom expression profile, except for Little St. George Island, whereas all three populations in the peninsula possessed distinct expression phenotypes. So we can use that transcriptome proteome map to actually identify which particular toxin loci were differentially expressed. So we found eight peaks uh, corresponding to about nine or more loci that explain most of the variation in this data set. So what you're seeing here, this is the center log ratio transform mean abundance for each one of the 25 peaks. Um, bars are color-coded by uh, population based on the previous map. So essentially anything above the x-axis is greater than the geometric mean and represents a high expression peak, whereas anything below the x-axis is less than the geometric mean and represents a low expression peak. So we can use this transcriptome proteome map to just look at specific examples of expression differentiation. For example, we see again here, so peak 2 contains myotoxin, that's the protein that causes spastic paralysis in the islands of mice. It's very abundant in every population, except it's essentially absent from population 6, which is Caledese Island population. We can come down here and we see again, so peak 21, it's low abundance or absent in most of our populations, except it's actually fairly abundant in Little St. George population. So we use this map to identify expression variation. I next wanted to know whether this variation actually mattered. So it was significantly different based on statistics, but does it actually affect the phenotype? So identifying genetic variation is often fairly simple. And that's mainly what I've been talking about here. We've identified genetic variation in the terms of expression differentiation. But does this variation actually affect the phenotype? Does it matter? Um, and like I said, normally doing testing for functional uh, differences between different genotypes is often very difficult. But in venoms, we have lots of different in vitro assays that we can use to functionally characterize venoms. So I looked at six adult venoms and the juvenile venom, and I tested them for three specific toxic activities. And I tested them for these specific activities because they directly correspond to expression levels of particular types of toxins. So that they come with these clear, testable predictions uh, where we can see if a population, for example, if population 3 possesses, uh, exhibits higher expression of one toxin relative to population 2, we can actually test whether that difference leads to an increase in activity like we would expect. So for brevity, I'm just going to sum up these results. Um, so essentially we tested for hemolytic activity, gelatinase activity, and proteinase activity, and across all three different tests, activity matched expression. So, for example, in our hemolytic activity, uh, we identified one hemolytic toxin in the venom of the eastern diamondback rattlesnake, and this was the most conserved um, peak across all populations. There was no expression variation. So, therefore, based purely on expression, we wouldn't expect any activity uh, differences, and that's exactly what we found. 
no variation in expression, no variation in venom activity. Whereas if we come down to gelatinase activity, we identified lots of differential expression in gelatinase proteins, so we would expect lots of different activity. And the differences that we found in activity perfectly matched expression. For example, population four had the most gelatinase enzymes present in its venom, it possessed the highest activity, whereas juvenile venom didn't possess any of these proteins and didn't exhibit activity at any concentration testing. So essentially, this just demonstrates that the statistical differences that we identified in protein expression directly correspond to functional differences in activity in a predictable, tractable manner, and the expression differentiation that we identified actually matters. It affects how venom functions. So we determined that our statistical approach was robust to actually identifying phenotypic differences. But again, my main question was which mechanism is more predominant? So we were identified significant expression differentiation. Well, is there significant sequence variation? We also need to directly compare the two. So because of our transcriptomic work, we've already identified the sequences um, for all the toxins that are actively expressed in the venom glands, and we've actually done this across uh, 14 different individuals representing 13 different species and three genera of pit vipers. So we've identified a bunch of toxins that are expressed in a bunch of different pit vipers, and then Aaron and I, along with Alan and Emily Lemon, we used this, along with some low coverage genome sequencing, to design probes for target enrichment through sequence capture. And essentially, we designed probes to target all the exons that are identified in all the toxin genes across all of these stacks of the largest exon uh, for 200 non-toxin genes that were also identified in the transcriptome, as well as over 1,000 anonymous loci and 348 anchored loci. So this is going to provide sequence information for not only the genes that are putatively under selection, venom genes, but also some neutral loci for us to look at population structure. And that's the first thing we did. Um, so we sequenced 140 individuals, 138 text filtered. We identified over 6,700 SNPs in the anonymous and anchored data set. And then we used um, DAPSI, or Discriminant Analysis of Principal Components, to identify and characterize the number of genetic clusters in our data. So what this approach aims to do is essentially minimize variation within a particular cluster while maximizing variation between them. Um, so if you look at the map, you see we have more samples that are included here. Um, for our venom work, we need a live individual, so our venom samples are, uh, do not always match. Our tissue samples, which we can get from museums and DORs and things like that. So we're able to look at uh, population structure across a wider range over in the Mississippi and up in South Carolina. And in our analysis, we identified three distinct genetic clusters. So we essentially have one cluster here, to east of the Suwannee River. We have one cluster here, west of the Suwannee River. Then we actually identified a distinct genetic cluster on Jekyll Island up in Georgia. Um, so this pattern here, we actually see these, what you see over here, these individual points. These represent pie charts. Um, it's placement probability for that particular individual in that genetic cluster. And we can see there's, there is some evidence of admixture across um, the Suwannee River Pier, which isn't terribly surprising. So this is a known suture zone for lots of different organisms, particularly reptiles and amphibians across Florida. Um, so throughout the Pleistocene, the Suwannee River actually formed an oceanic current, the Suwannee Straits, that isolated peninsular Florida from the rest of the continent, potentially did this multiple times. Um, so this pattern is not terribly surprising given uh, the geological history of Florida. So next I look for divergence across these three genetic clusters. Um, so previously my analysis looking at venom expression, we just divided these a priori into populations based on putative barriers. And based back here, we see, well, maybe the Apalachicola River isn't a barrier. Um, now, it didn't bias our expression estimates because of the randomization tests. It would combine similar populations, but not necessarily split a single population into two if they were different. So that's why we attempted to kind of split into as many populations as we could with a reason for sample size and putative barriers and things like that. But now I reanalyze the data using those three genetic clusters. And first, I look at sequence divergence. So essentially what we did is uh, we calculated an FST estimate for all pair-ice comparisons across these three genetic clusters um, for both the toxin loci and all the neutral loci. So the neutral loci provide sort of our null distribution, so seen here in gray. These are the single FST estimates, FSTs on the x-axis. The gray bars represent the FST for uh, our putative neutral loci, so our anonymous and our anchored loci. And this this represents the 95th percentile of that distribution. We consider toxins to be significantly differentiated across populations 
if they exceeded the 95th percentile of that distribution. So what we found uh, down here, you see these individual red ticks. These are the individual toxin loci. So again, any loci up here were considered significantly differentiated. Um, I want to point out we did have to do some more stringent filtering for the toxin loci um, to account for uh, pseudogenes and paralogs that were very common within toxin genes that were sort of problematic in constructing the alignments for SNP calling. Um, the stringent filtering that we used, it may have biased us against rare alleles, but I don't think that's an issue here because the rare alleles probably would not have popped up in our outlier analyses because they are rare. Um, so if we look at each comparison, the East versus the Jekyll cluster, we see we identified three outlier toxin loci, and in these loci we identified three non-synonymous SNPs that were significantly differentiated. In this East-West comparison here, seven loci uh, with six non-synonymous SNPs. And over here, Jekyll versus the Western cluster, we only identified a single outlier toxin locus and only a single synonymous SNP. But in these two comparisons, we did identify some evidence of potentially directional selection in these particular genes. So what about venom divergence? So we've identified sequence divergence at this scale. What about venom divergence? So we again uh, classified individuals based on the three populations. We conducted this non-parametric MANOVA. We did identify significant differentiation in venom expression across these three populations. So what you see down here, this is a, a group dispersion plot. So the centroid corresponds essentially to the mean of that particular group with lines drawn to individual samples present in that cluster. Um, so this is Jekyll Island down here, which was not in our previous analyses. Um, it has a very different venom. And this is, this is east over here on the left, and west on the right. And even though they are significantly different, we can see there's a ton of within cluster variation here. But that's not surprising given that we know from our previous analyses that there's multiple expression phenotypes within each cluster. So what about within each cluster? We know there's expression differentiation within each cluster. Is there also sequence divergence within each cluster? So again, we quickly reanalyze the venom data uh, using these populate the three genetic clusters as our guides, and we separate that out into five populations that we have venom on in the eastern cluster, three populations in the western cluster. And we can see that all five populations here, again, this is this data dispersion plot, all five populations within the eastern cluster possess a distinct expression phenotype, whereas in the west, we again see that panhandle animals possess a single expression phenotype, while little St. George is significantly different. So this is largely consistent with what I talked about earlier. So what about sequence divergence? So what we did is for each pairwise comparison, both across the three clusters and for all the populations within each cluster, we calculated a mean toxin FST estimate and a mean neutral FST estimate, and then compared the two to try to identify what type of selective regime was acting on the estimate on the x-axis. We have the toxin FST estimate on the y-axis. I just want to quickly point out there are negative values here. So this is where in Cochrane's FST, not Wright's FST, um, just negative values essentially should be interpreted as zeros under Wright's model. Um, so this solid line here, this represents a perfect fit, while this dashed line is the line that fits our data. Um, there was a significant relationship between neutral and toxin FST. You can see we have a pretty poor R squared, uh, 0.27. That's mainly because of this single outlier down here, where we have a fair amount of neutral divergence, but actually no toxin divergence whatsoever, suggesting purifying selection. Um, so if we remove this single outlier, and we put a line on R squared and improves, it goes up to 0.7, indicating that neutral divergence was actually a fair predictor of toxin divergence. Um, but I next want to know which particular comparisons showed evidence of which type of selective regime. So essentially anything where toxin sequence divergence exceeded neutral divergence, we considered evidence of positive or relaxed selection. Um, comparisons where neutral divergence exceeded toxin divergence as evidence of purifying selection. And comparisons where the two were roughly equal as evidence of drift. So essentially anything above our perfect fit line, we have more toxin sequence divergence than we would expect in neutrality. So this is either evidence of positive or relaxed selection. Anything below our perfect fit line, we have less toxin sequence divergence than we would expect under neutrality, suggesting purifying selection. And if any points fall on the line, the two estimates are roughly equal, indicating genetic drift. So we can see that we have more estimate of more comparisons that show evidence of positive or relaxed selection relative to purifying selection, but the frequency of the two was not significant. So I want to know whether those particular comparisons were they evolving under positive or relaxed selection. So I'm interested in adaptation, 
Obviously, demonstrating positive directional selection is very important when you're interested in looking at adaptation. So I again looked at uh, the distribution of the neutral loci and I found the 95th percentile and then looked for outlier loci that exceeded that distribution. So I'm showing you here, these are the three comparisons with the greatest differences between toxin and neutral FST estimates. We identified three toxin loci that were significantly differentiated across all of these comparisons. Within those three loci, across all comparisons, we identified 12 SNPs. All of those SNPs were non-synonymous. There was not a single synonymous SNP outlier in any of these analyses, suggesting that for at least some of these comparisons, there was positive selection. Okay, so what do we find? Well, we have evidence for both across, we have evidence for both mutational classes, both expression variation and sequence variation across and within clusters, but not in all cases. Right in the panhandle, we found a lack of expression differentiation across some populations. We actually found strong evidence of purifying selection, indicating that our particular approach was capable of identifying other selective regimes than just positive or directional selection. But going back to my main question, um, what is the genetic basis of adaptation for a complex trait that isn't biased? I predicted expression variation, and we actually identified both. Um, so why was my hypothesis not supported? Well, maybe this temporal component to adaptation. So I predicted that expression differentiation would be the predominant mechanism because there's more ways of altering the amounts of protein produced relative to function through their primary structure. Well, we can imagine that this bias may be most prevalent over relatively short timescales when generating beneficial variation, maybe the bottleneck in the adaptive process. So this comparison here, we looked at the entire range of adamantias, and based on mitochondrial dating, we know it's over about 1.2 million years of divergence. And obviously, given enough time, we do expect beneficial sequence variants to arise. I didn't predict that that would never happen. I just thought that expression variation would be more predominant. We can imagine that over relatively short time scales, generating beneficial variation may be the bottleneck, so we may see this bias more prevalent over relatively short time scales. Okay, so going back to the outline, we identified sequence variation, we directly compared the two. Again, we found evidence for both, but over a wide geographic scale and over, over a million years of divergence. So the last part of my dissertation was kind of looking at rapid adaptation over a very short time scale, <coughs> see if this bias with expression differentiation was found there, and try to connect to genotype, phenotype, and fitness. So unfortunately, uh, studying adaptive molecular evolution in natural populations um, has been limited by trying to connect these three phases, genotype, phenotype, and fitness, often because it's very difficult to do, particularly for complex traits because of the many to one mapping of genotype and phenotype that I touched on earlier. So, so far I've been talking about genotypic variation in forms of both expression and sequence variation. We've also touched on phenotypic variation a little bit. So the venom phenotype is actually the effects of the venom once it's injected. And those in vitro assays that I touched on, they showed that expression differentiation did affect the phenotype. But most of these assays were actually performed on my own blood, and I'm clearly not the target, got a mantis venom. So if we actually want to look at the phenotype and fitness, we need to test the efficacy of venom in natural local prey. Um, this is very difficult to do, it's possible in venoms, and as I found out, it's very difficult. Um, but connecting all three of these phases for an animal in natural populations has really never been done before. So again, if I want to study men phenotypes and men fitness, I need to study what they're eating. And here in North Florida, that's the hispid cotton rat, or sigmodon hispidus. So it's a moderately sized rodent, averages about 100 grams. It's very common throughout Central and North America. And most importantly, uh, Bruce Means found with his work on tall timbers, not far from here, that sigmodon was by far the most common prey item of adamantius in North Florida. So for this comparison, we're going to be focusing on just a single island mainland comparison, looking at the Little St. George Island down here in the adjacent mainland region of the Apalachicola National Forest. So Little St. George Island, it's a Holocene formation, it's believed to be between four and 5,000 years old, and it's about seven kilometers from the mouth of the Apalachicola River Delta. So what I did is I collected 15 mainland and 11 island rattlesnakes, I collected a venom sample, blood samples, some measurements, and released them, and then used Sherman live traps, to collect sigmodon, both on the mainland and the island, so we collected 45 mainland rats and 50 island rats, and then brought these individuals back to the lab for toxicity or fitness assays. And I want to point out that while trapping on the mainland, I identified multiple prey sources. There was multiple species of paramiscus, there's squirrels, there's bulls, there's rabbits, 
Whereas on Little St. George, Sigma was the only available brace force on the island. And that was the only rodent that I trapped. In our two years of trapping out there. Again, supporting this idea that islands often lead to these altered interactions that allow us to study contemporary evolution. Okay, so how do we measure venom fitness? Um, so venom, because it's mostly protein, it's very metabolically costly to make. So we can imagine that selection should act on venom economy. And the way it could do that is increase venom toxicity and you reduce the amount of venom, amount of venom needed to kill a particular prey item. And the way we measure venom toxicity is through what we call medium lethal dose or LD50 assays. So what this measures is essentially the amount of venom required to kill half of an experimental group over a given time period. So I performed LD50 assays on both mainland and island cotton rats using both mainland and island prey, and these are cyclical comparisons. And essentially what we found is that both snake populations satisfied home versus foreign, uh, local versus foreign, and home versus away criteria, indicating that they were in fact locally adapted. So what you're looking at here in this plot, we have venom efficacy, or essentially toxicity or fitness, increasing on the y-axis. We have mainland prey here on the left, island prey on the right. Island venom is in red. These error bars indicate 95% confidence intervals. And we can see that both snake populations have higher fitness or better venom against sympatric prey and allopatric prey. So we've identified this pattern. Both populations are, in fact, locally adapted. But I'm more interested in the process. So what's the genetic mechanism underlying this observed difference in fitness? Is it predominantly expression variation, sequence variation, or both like we found over a larger geographic and temporal scale? So what we found, we already know from our previous work that there is significant expression differentiation between these populations. So we did some additional analyses, and what we found is that expression differentiation was biased towards low expression proteins. So as you're seeing here on all of these plots, we essentially have mainland mean peak expression, or mainland protein expression on the x-axis. We have the mean island expression on the y-axis. Again, solid line indicates a perfect fit. And these dashed lines are, again, the geometric mean for that particular population. The geometric mean here sort of represents the average expression level of a protein in that particular venom. So anything less than that we consider low expression proteins, whereas anything greater than the average we consider high expression proteins. We can see that most of our expression differentiation between populations is actually constrained to low expression proteins. With high expression proteins, they're actually conserved not only across populations, there's also very little variation within a population. But this particular analysis over here, each point you see, this is a particular HPLC peak. And again, an individual peak can contain one, sometimes two, three, or even four different proteins. And for this given peak down here, any of those particular proteins could be differentially expressed, but not necessarily all. So I want to increase resolution, I want to get locus-specific resolution, and identify the specific toxic proteins that were differentially expressed across populations. So for this, we use quantitative mass spectrometry. So before, we separated venom into its components, into those 25 peaks, we isolated each peak, and then performed quantitative mass spectrometry. Now what we did for five individuals from each population is we essentially took a whole venom sample and did shotgun proteomics in a quantitative fashion to get locus-specific expression levels for each individual protein. So again, what you're seeing here is now each point corresponds to an individual toxic protein rather than an individual peak. But we see a very similar pattern, whereas most of the high expression proteins are conserved across and within populations, whereas most of our differentiation and variation is constrained to our low expression proteins. So we can then use residuals to look at which proteins are most differentially expressed across populations. And we see here, in the island population, we have four proteases that actually all belong to the same gene family, which are upregulated or more abundant in the island venom, suggesting maybe concerted regulation of these four loci. We have four other proteins that are more, much more abundant in the mainland population that belong to a variety of different gene families. But based on this analysis, I didn't really find interesting which particular proteins were differentially expressed, but rather that low expression proteins were differentially expressed. Well, again, why would we see this? Well, the expression of a particular protein should be a trade-off between the benefit of its function and the cost of its production. We therefore imagine that selection should drive the expression of proteins close to levels that maximize this trade-off, but particularly for high expression proteins because of the increased energetic cost of production. We therefore can imagine that stronger stabilizing selection of high expression proteins may actually reduce the amount of standing expression variation in those proteins in the population. 
That's exactly what we see. We see very little standing expression variation in high expression proteins with lots of standing expression variation in low expression proteins. This may actually increase the evolvability of this class of proteins, suggesting that rapid adaptive expression divergence may initially occur through expression differentiation in low expression proteins from standing genetic variation. Um, but it's long been known that expression level predicts sequence evolutionary rates, so high, so high expression proteins often tend to show slower rates of sequence evolution. What we've shown, at least over short time scales, is that high expression proteins also exhibit slower rates of expression evolution. So what about sequence divergence? So we knew, we knew that there was significant expression differentiation. We identified this differentiation as constraint to low expression proteins. But was there also significant sequence divergence across high limiting populations? So the first thing we did is we calculated mean FST estimates for each type of locus that we sequenced. And essentially, we can see very little sequence divergence across any of these comparisons, whereas our estimate for toxin loci is actually lower than what we see in our mutual data, suggesting potentially purifying selection overall in toxin genes. But again, this is a mean FST estimate. It's based on all toxin loci. And obviously, over a very, not only do we not expect all loci to exhibit significant differentiation in the evolving directional selection, but particularly under a short time scale, four to 5,000 years, we do not expect all toxin loci to be evolving under strong directional selection. So I want to look at each individual toxin locus. So we perform the same sort of outlier detection analyses that we performed before. So again, this gray bar, this is our neutral or our null distribution, our 95th percentile. These red ticks are our individual toxin loci. And essentially, we identified three toxin loci that exceeded the 95th percentile of the null distribution. These are these loci here. One, nerve growth factor only possessed synonymous SNPs. Those are high FST estimates, suggesting that that isn't responsible for the identified adaptive divergence in venom function because these are synonymous. They're not changing the amino acid in the protein. And although we detected four non-synonymous variants in metalloproteas 4, all four of those variants were actually absent from the island population. All of this variation was just within the mainland population. And we did identify a non-synonymous variant present in the island population in endothelial growth factor 1. This was present at low frequency. It was only found in three individuals. Again, suggesting that that low frequency SNP was not responsible for the identified adaptive divergence that we identified. Um, but I want to dig a little deeper. So that now we're looking at individual loci that are differentially expressed. What about specific mutations? And site analysis, so the distribution is now the FST estimate for each individual site. Again, it's neutral loci, toxin SNPs down here, 95th percentile. We identified three particular SNPs that exceeded this distribution, but all of them were synonymous. Again, suggesting that they are not responsible for the identified differences in venom fitness that we found in our toxicity assays. So sort of the last part of this chapter was looking at the relationship between gene flow and selection. So gene flow traditionally is thought as sort of this homogenizing force that opposes directional selection and ultimately prevents local adaptation. Um, some more recent work has found that the interaction between these two forces is actually much more complex. And although gene flow can most certainly prevent local adaptation, in certain instances, particularly where populations have low genetic diversity, it may actually promote adaptation by increasing genetic variation and therefore phenotypic variation for selection to act on. So I identified rapid adaptive venom divergence, but this population may have suffered a genetic bottleneck following colonization, could have been inbred. It also has been shown to be beneficial in co-evolutionary interactions. So I was interested in examining whether this adaptation occurred in the presence or absence of gene flow. So for this, I used Peter's program, Migrate N, so it's a coalescent-based approach, and I used base factors to compare four different models. So the four models I looked at, the first one was a four-parameter model, the full migration model, where we have two effective population sizes and bidirectional migration. I then looked at two three-parameter models, where we have, again, two effective population sizes, a unidirectional migration, so in one model, only migration from mainland to island, and then the other, only migration from island to mainland. And the fourth model was a single-parameter model, where we looked at panmixia, we're essentially stating that all the individuals belong to the same randomly made population. So I looked at this in the long anonymous, short anonymous, and anchor data sets, use base factors to compare the two. And the short anonymous is still running, 
But for both the long anonymous and the angered, identified that the single pamictic population model was by far the best model for the sensory probability of one in both data sets. Um, so going back to my question, so did this adaptation occur in the presence or absence of gene flow? Um, I don't really know, and I don't think I can answer that question. Um, so we could argue, well, they wanted the same population, there's very little neutral divergence, there's obviously high migration rates between the two populations, suggesting that adaptation happened in the presence of gene flow and under presumably strong selection. But the lack of neutral differentiation and this model could simply reflect the lack of time that neutral divergence has had to accumulate. Again, this island's only four to 5,000 years old. These snakes may have colonized the, uh, the island well after it formed. They typically have a generation time of three to four years on the mainland, but we've seen on the island the snakes are actually dwarf, and we're not sure at what age or size they reach sexual maturity in the island population. And this alteration of life history and the lack of time for neutral differentiation to occur could also give us this pattern indicating that adaptation occurred in the absence of gene flow, we just haven't had enough time for neutral differentiation to accumulate. But overall, kind of what I did in my dissertation was use a transcriptome proteal map to identify the genetic basis of a complex phenotype, use that map to identify significant expression differentiation between <coughs> populations and age classes. I used in vitro assays to demonstrate that those differences corresponded to functional differences. We identified significant toxin sequence divergence across the range, indicating that both mutational mechanisms contribute to adaptive divergence over large geographic and temporal scales. But over relatively short time scales, we see that adaptive divergence is confined to expression differentiation and low expression proteins, particularly from standing expression variation, suggesting that in complex traits that aren't inherently biased, both mutations do occur, but over different timescales. Over short timescales, we're going to see expression differentiation. Over longer timescales, we will see both mutational mechanisms contribute, essentially providing qualitative predictions for future work on complex traits. Okay, so now it's for all like the emotional, touchy-feely stuff. Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank NSF and FSU and the Global Tourist Council for paying for all of this. Um, I'm fortunate that my advisor is very good at getting large NSF grants that can pay for all of my work. Um, I'd like to thank everyone on my committee, so Aaron, Peter, Greg, Alice, and Joe, for putting up with me over the past five and a half years. Um, lots of former graduate students who are no longer here helped me both in the field and the lab, um, particularly Brian. I'd also like to thank collaborators here and elsewhere um, for assisting on a lot of this work. Uh, Margaret probably knows more about adamantius venom than I do. Um, and then Alan and Emily uh, for collaborating on the seed capture work. So I'd like to thank everyone in the Rikita Lab. Um, Darren has been a great advisor and essentially provided me with lots of opportunities um, that it enabled me to be in the position that I am today. Um, former postdoc in the lab, who all of you know is in dear to your hearts, Dr. Kenny Gray, um, was really instrumental <laughs> in helping me with all of my field work. Um, Makaya almost drowned in a hurricane, like he rode with me on an island. Um, so I'm going to thank Makaya for that. And uh, Alyssa, who's been a volunteer in our lab, who has really been like another grad student. And without these people, um, my project, my graduate career would have turned out much differently. I'd also like to thank my family. Um, so yes, this is me and my sister. So you can see growing up, herping was kind of a family hobby. Um, it's a hobby that I've turned into a career. Without the support of them, I would not be standing in front of you today. I also want to extend a special thanks to my girlfriend, Kristen. Um, she was my go-to field tech for rodent trapping. She was an only taking a nap or two on the job. Um, even though she's a psychologist, she's dove head on in into the fun world of herbs. Um, so as Darren pointed out, uh, assuming I passed today, I hope I did already accepted a position in Washington <laughs> State, uh, working in Andrew Stroper's lab looking at the evolutionary interactions between Tasmanian devils and this infectious facial tumor um, that may ultimately lead to their extinction. <coughs> I know that was fairly long. I appreciate your guys' patience. Um, with time left, I'll be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>